Chapter Twenty Four of the Seventh Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seventh Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Twenty Four. Kindness Rewarded. Mary, Geraldine, and Doris went alone the next day to the home of Myra Comely. Danny O'Neill drove them there, then waited in the cutter until they came out. Myra opened the door slightly, saying that perhaps they would better not come in, but Geraldine declared that she never caught anything, and as Mary and Doris had no fears, they entered the neat little living room and sat down, while Doris gave the message from her mother. Tears sprang to the girl's eyes. "'How very kind of your mother to offer to send us her own private nurse,' she said with sincere appreciation. "'Dr. Carson was with us all night, and he says that this crisis is now over, and that mother will not have pneumonia.' but that she is worn out and will need absolute rest for a long time. The doctor said that she ought to go where winters are milder. Myra was wiping her eyes, trying, as the girls could see, to keep from breaking down. Doris went to her and put an arm across her shoulders. With tender sympathy, she said, Myra, you're just worn out with these three days and nights of watching and anxiety. I wish you would let me telephone mother to send our dear old nurse. Then I would like to take you home with me for a rest. But the girl was shaking her head. Oh, no, no, I, I, I couldn't leave mother. She still has spells of wandering in her mind. She thinks she's a girl again on the father's ranch in Arizona. She got no farther, for the three girls exclaimed in an excited chorus, Was your mother Myra Cornwall? Has she a brother Caleb in Arizona? The girl dropped her handkerchief and stared in unbelieving amazement. How in the world did you know my mother's maiden name? she gasped. Mother has told no one. Not that she was ashamed of it, but, but you see, she married against her parents' wishes, and she knew they would never want to see her or hear from her again. Her brother Caleb disliked my father more than even her parents did, and so she never wrote, not even after my father died and we were so poor. Then, with a mouth trembling and eyes tear-brimmed, the girl asked, Won't you tell me what you know about it? And so Doris told about the clipping they had found in the Dorchester paper, and how they had called on all the Myras they could find. But your mother was born in New York State, Mary recalled. That's why we decided that she could not be the one. Myra nodded. Yes, that is where mother was born. But her parents went west when she was five, and she had lived on a ranch in that beautiful desert country until she was sent east to school. Suddenly she sprang up, a glad light in her face. Mother is awake. I hear her calling me. I must go and tell her the wonderful news. Then, impulsively, she held out her hand to Doris as she said, How can we thank you? Now, as soon as mother is well, I can take her to the home she is so yearned to see, knowing that her brother Caleb wants her, really wants her. When the girls were again in the sleigh, they told Danny to race for town. They were to attend the weekly meeting at Peg's house, and they had wonderful news to tell. In a remarkably short time, they reached there and found the others assembled. Girls! Doris burst out before she had removed her outdoor wraps. The mystery is solved. Myra Comely, I mean the mother, is the one we wanted. And now that she may go back to her Arizona home and won't have to take in washing any more, she will get well, I am sure, just ever so soon. Myra is going to send a telegram at once to her uncle, and I know that he will send money for them for the journey. Now all of the mysteries are solved, except where the boys have their club room, Peg began, when Bertha laughingly told them that wasn't even a mystery any longer. How come? Peg asked. Well, last night Mother wanted a yeast cake from the store just before bedtime that she might put some dough to rise. Dad had gone to the lodge and Bob had left early with the boys, so I took a lantern and went to the store. I had a key to the side door and I went in. At first I was very much startled to see a light coming through the cracks in the floor of a storeroom over the back part. One has to go up a ladder on the side wall, then crawl through a trap door to get to it. I was just wondering why thieves would want to go up there where Dad keeps hardware supplies and things like that, when I heard a laugh and I knew it was Bob. Then I realised that I had stumbled upon the secret meeting place of the CDC. Well, that's much more sensible place than the old Wesley ruin would be, Mary commented. Having removed their wraps, they all sat about the cosy fire, and Peg passed around the garments they were making for the orphans. There's one thing sure, the solving of our mystery sped sunshine all right, and so we lived up to our first motto without really meaning to, Mary commented. Peg inquired, did you hear anything that the boys were talking about? I tried not to, Bertha said. 
I went at once to the front of the store and got my yeast cake, but, just as I was stealing back out again so that they wouldn't hear me, I heard Bob say, Four o'clock Saturday, that's tomorrow, surprise the girls. The seven sleuths looked at each other in puzzled amazement. Hmm, another mystery, I should say, Peg commented. Mary glanced at her wrist watch. Well, if the boys are planning a surprise for us, since it is three thirty now, we won't be kept in long in suspense. Nor were they. For, in half an hour, punctually at four, the boys arrived and stated that they had received permission from the parents of the girls to take them somewhere on a sleigh ride. Oh, what fun! Mary sprang up, as did the others. Little blue garments were folded and outdoor wraps were donned upstairs in Peg's room. I know, I know, Peg sang out. You remember that time at the Drexel Lodge when we wanted to stay and ride home by moonlight? We couldn't, and the boys said they would take us for a moonlight ride at some other time. Mary nodded. I believe you're right. Where do you suppose we are going? It was half an hour later, and the village had been left far behind before the answer was revealed to them. Up the East Lake Road, Bertha exclaimed. It was half-past five and dark when they drew up in front of the inn. Mr. Wiggin, the genial host, popped out to welcome them. "'Come right in, come right in,' he called good-naturedly. "'Everything is piping hot and ready to serve.' The girls were delighted. "'Oh, boys, you're giving us a surprise supper, aren't you? That's jolly fun. Aren't we glad we know them?' There were a few of the many expressions of appreciation from the girls as they were being helped from the long sleigh. That something was piping hot and ready to be served proved to be the wonderful combination clam chowder for which the lakeside inn was famous. The dining room was warm and cheerful, with red shaded lamps around the walls, and the jolliest hour was passed while the boys joked and told stories, which they had evidently learnt for the occasion. When the dessert, Mrs. Wiggins' equally famous plum pudding, had been removed, Bob tapped on the table for attention. Young ladies, he said, we boys of the CDC, having heard how cleverly you solved a mystery. What? How did you hear? two of the girls exclaimed in surprise. "'Well, that is an important point to clear up,' Bob acknowledged. "'Jack here was in the telegraph station about three this afternoon, "'and Myra Comley was there sending a message to some uncle of hers in Arizona. "'She was so excited she spilled the beans and told Jack all about your mystery club "'and how you found her mother's brother.' "'He paused to look about at the astonished group. "'Then, seeming to be satisfied, he continued. "'We boys are working on a mystery, and since you girls are so clever—' "'No bouquets, please,' he pretended to dodge. "'We thought we would invite you to, uh, be associate members of our club. "'We hope that you will consider it an honour. "'Mary sprang up and, lifting her glass of water, said, "'Here's to the combined Conan Doyle and Seven Sleuths Club. "'Long may they wave.' "'Ditto!' Bob lifted his glass, as did the others, "'and then they all rose, for Jack had dropped a nickel in the automatic organ "'and was playing dance music which could not be resisted.' End of chapter 24